To discuss current political issues, we invited political expert Maxim Yakovlev, an associate professor at Political Science Department of Kiev Mohila Academy. Nice to meet you. Nice so, as we seen mentioned Bild report on Russia's supervision of uh, the self-proclaimed republics, um, it has confirmed that Russia does not and will not want to adhere to the Minsk agreements, and uh, as it has its own strategy of Donbass uh, um, integration to the Federation. How do you think uh, the uh, Ukraine can resist such uh, implementation of such scenario? I think one of the most positive aspects of what happened with all this reporting stuff and this uh, uh, journalist report and what is going on and which type of pressure and control does the, Rus does the Russian authorities or groups of interest have over this Muppet states or Muppet republics, I think for the first, finally we can as Ukrainians put forward the claim that has been always there, that pressuring Ukraine from our side to fulfill our part of the Minsk agreement, what we have to implement, and we're trying our best and we're working hard on implementing them and uh, keeping the ceasefire and everything the Ukraine can do about it. On the other hand, what is uh, unfortunate in this whole situation that the Russian controlled troops and uh, the Russian interest groups who really control this so-called republics, they're not willing to like leave in terms of letting it go or really do not, they really do not want to implement Minsk agreements to its full. That's why our foreign partners, and by meaning so our partners who are also involved in these negotiations, and those who can also exert more pressure on Russia, I hope, and uh, I hope that they would take it as a sign, or as at least indicators, that they need to work harder with Russia in order to, uh, to, like, in order to be, for us also Ukrainians, to be able to finally reach long-lasting peace in the east of our country. So do you think that uh, we need still to implement all, to fulfill all the necessary provisions uh, of Minsk agreements as we see the uh, other side just ignores them? Uh, do you still need that we should? Uh... Uh, well, I think from my, from my side, uh, it is always a good indicator if a government or a state sticks to a certain agreement. On the other hand, on the other hand if the agreement is not being implemented and is violated or even ignored by, by, one, or by one of the parties, then it's a clear indicator that this agreement is no agreement as such. That's why we either need a new agreement or a totally new format of working with, especially Russia in this case. Thank you. And uh, now let's continue with other internal political processes of the current week. Ukrainian parliament allowed to place in detention a judge from Odessa who is suspected in bribery. 247 MPs were in favor, seven abstained and nobody voted against. Oleksiy Buran, the judge of Malinovsky District Court, was present in the courtroom. Before the voting, he appealed to MPs. He reported that evidences against him do not correspond to reality. He told his own version of the situation that happened on 29th of March. He said when representatives of anti-corruption bureau had come to his home, he was in the basement. So he did not want to lay hands on himself, he cut himself by chance. So, uh, as we see, the support of such decision was not a problem for the parliament, yet uh, we cannot be sure for other um, issues uh, that the unity will be in the parliament. So, I would like you to share the opinion on the present state and the future of um, Ukrainian parliamentary coalition. Uh, thank you very much for starting this question about Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian parliament, uh, parliament and Ukrainian coalition with such a funny case, especially April's <laughs> Fool's Day, because in, if in such a funny situation with this judge and I also listen to his excuses, which he really brought forward in the national parliament of a country saying that uh, there was wrong and how he explained this story, it is really funny. So we have to admit that. Uh, what is not funny about the whole story is really this, the, the, the conditions under which the whole parliament of Ukraine is working and this lack of coalition, especially these agreements. Uh, I think that this is, these are the good examples of clashes of uh, also oligarchic interests and some uh, groups who are behind these interests. And we definitely have uh, a number of parties, or at least two parties, who really, if the new elections uh, really take place this year, so as soon as possible, then they would not get uh, sufficient places, if any, mandates in the newly uh, new elected parliament. That's why I think that uh, the, the funny stuff about parliament is that some people really lose the, their political standing and the influence. And if they want to agree, and I think they really feel the pressure either to agree or form a new government or some form of coalition. But uh, as uh, I would, I would um, hesitate to say that this is a, a very bad situation, but it is definitely not good to have a coalition which works only under the fear of not being elected 
and only uh, based on premises that we buy some de deputies from other factions to put them together to form something like that. That would not be viable. So do you think that the elections will be? Uh, <laughs> is it your prediction? <laughs> I think predictions and prognosis in terms of social science are very tricky thing. But uh, I would say that this is something that would be a logical outcome of, of such a crisis in any well-established and de developed democracy. But in terms of Ukraine, uh, my guess is that uh, the new elections would, would definitely bring about uh, some kind of development in terms of democracy maturity of Ukraine. But it's still, I think we still need a couple of years to go before we establish a truly working democracy, at least what concerns the parliamentary practices. Okay, and let us continue with other uh, events. So, on Tuesday, 29th of March, the Verkhovna Rada of Ukraine voted to grant consent by President Petro Poroshenko to dismiss Prosecutor General Viktor Shokin. The draft resolution was announced by President's representative in Parliament, Stepan Kubiv, who recalled that Petro Poroshenko submitted the draft to Parliament on February 22nd. Shokin's resignation this time was supported by 289 members of Parliament. The deputies expressed their opinions on Prosecutor General's works. It was him who changed the structure. It was him who agreed to launch open competitions while recruiting prosecutors. The biggest his trouble was failure in reforming the prosecutor's office. This failure happened because Shokin fired 5,000 officers but still didn't get increase wage from the state budget. It was the very one prosecutor who didn't take courage to investigate the diamond prosecutor's case, to investigate upon Mr. Akhmetov, who worked out fortress plan against the president, against the country. This is the very one prosecutor who didn't take courage to investigate the case of Karpenko against Igor Kolomoisky. A person who was building the system of corruption in prosecutor's office cannot reform it. I recall how near a year ago we were walking here in the session hall and persuading those who now criticize him to vote for Shokin's resignation. Shokin's appointment was a mistake, but there will be a similar mistake if the president will nominate Shokin's deputy. Viktor Shokin was the third prosecutor general during the last two years. He was appointed instead of Vitaly Yerema in February of 2015. The first one was Oleg Magnitsky. Unlike the latter two persons who were in office only for several months, Shokin held the position for more than a year. Let us recall you about the activity of the 13th Ukrainian prosecutor general. The president appointed Viktor Shokin on February 10, 2015. He came to the parliament and asked the deputies to vote for Shokin. As Petro Poroshenko said, Shokin has steel character. His professional experience and good reputation are the main factors which influenced my decision. In the same day, Viktor Shokin promised to investigate drastic crimes against Maidan and cases of high officials of Yanukovych's regime. With your support, we can together make real steps in fighting corruption and strengthening the law. Shokin collected 318 votes of deputies for his appointment. In two following months, he, together with his deputy head, David Sakvaralidze, presented the strategy of reforming prosecutors' offices. Then he stated that there must be a new way of working with the personnel. During half the year, near 2,000 servants were fired from the general prosecutor's office. For the first time, Shokin's resignation became talked about in May. Then Yehor Sobolev, head of the parliament's anti-corruption committee, demanded, unless the crimes against Yeromaidan are in investigated, the committee will raise the issue of prosecutor's general dismissal. After the escape of deputy Serhii Kluyev, deputies started collecting signatures for Shokin's resignation. He was accused in giving Kluyev an opportunity to escape from the country, because prosecutor's office did not arrest him before lifting the immunity. Then a conflict flared between the old and young officers. Kaisko and Sakurilidze announced that Shokin pressed on their decisions. Signatures against Shokin were collected two times. The first document mysteriously disappeared. In February, the president agreed to resign Shokin. A month earlier, he did not support the idea. At last, Viktor Shokin asked for dismissal himself and then took a vacation. Members of the parliament accepted their resignation only on March 29. 
few hours before the voting of Ukrainian Parliament for resignation of Prosecutor General Viktor Shokin, he fired Deputy Prosecutor General and Prosecutor of Odessa region from his position. Prosecutor General repealed the position of David, David Sakvarelidze, explaining such a decision by demand of law of Ukraine about Prosecutor General office. Moreover, he holds Mr. Sakvarelidze to disciplinary responsibility for major violation of prosecutor's ethics. The situation around the firing on Deputy Prosecutor General, who criticized his colleagues, is actively discussed in social networks and media. I think that we managed to break the system somehow. We wanted to prove that there is no place in the system for immunity of so-called diamond prosecutors and generals. Our team is the only one team which acted against the current prosecutor's ethic because of which I was fired and defied the system. We uncovered the corruptionist on all levels despite of their position, connections and so on. Such kind of attack on my team means that current authority doesn't need real reforms in Ukraine. Well, as we can see, the dismissal of um, Sekoro Lidze revealed explicitly the already existing conflict between old and new forces within the general prosecutor's office. And yet the president did not make any official statement towards that. And he doesn't comment it. Uh, he didn't co not comment it. So what do you think? Whose side will choose Petro <laughs> Brzezhenko in that uh, case? Um, I'm now I feel really that I have something to say about the, the prosecution and all this conflict that appeared. For the first, I would like to stress that it is now widely accepted by many Ukrainian, uh, not only political experts, but experts in different fields, that the reform of prosecution was a great failure. If by some statistics we have up to 90% of prosecutors who were formerly loyal to the former regime and were involved in different corruption schemes, if they were reappointed to the same position, positions they occupied before the reform, then the whole notion of reform, when you have 9 of 10 people occupying almost the same position in you, then there is no reform as such at hand. We just wasted a lot of money on nothing, basically. The second thing uh, about uh, Shokin, and this is a very strange situation, because it's definitely a disgrace to, uh, to what is going on in Ukraine in terms, of, in terms of our aspirations to build a democratic regime and a system where the rule of law would prevail. Because uh, I would agree, I have like no personal feelings toward the, uh, the prosecutor Shokin, but we have to admit that this person somehow lost touch with reality. Uh, because many of the comments or many of the actions, I would not, I am not in the position to comment on, on everything the prosecution uh, in his office did, general prosecution of Ukraine did in, uh, when he was uh, the prosecutor. But we can all discuss how many things were not done and still need to be done and need to be taken care of, especially like lawsuits against the people who are loyal to Yanukovych regime and who are who are involved in stealing uh, people's money, basically. On the third, I would like to comment and uh, was interesting uh, uh, column, editorial board column in the New York Times commenting the visit of President Poroshenko to the United States where they explicitly mentioned uh, the relationship to the prosecution and especially the, our American colleagues and partners on whom we are unfortunately dependent for money because we need support for our economy. Uh, <clears throat> And we have to admit that if uh, such, uh, such a newspaper brings forward such a question that the president is somehow related to what is going to prosecute, and he is, so then it is a good question that he needs to comment because there are some allegations that he's, if not involved, then he's not doing anything in the situation where he could take care and control of the ongoing situation. So uh, as for the conflict between Sekvarelidze, I'm not saying that Sekvarelidze is a perfect person. Nobody is perfect. But I think that we need some, you know, at least from inside the structure, we need uh, some people who would bring something new, who would, you know, stress, I mean, who would uh, do something that would lead to changes and reforms. And I hope that out of these conflicts, something positive in terms of really reforming the prosecution in Ukraine might develop. And don't you think that the... Um uh, making the position of general prosecutor independent from the appointment by the president would make a, a real step towards the resolution of such uh, problems? You know, it's an interesting question. I, I, I have to admit that I haven't done much research on how the prosecutors are appointed abroad because you, as a scientist, I definitely need to approach the facts and figures and, and the practices uh, which are there in the developed world, so to speak. But I would say in Ukraine, it is a good idea, idea definitely. But in Ukraine, we have to admit, unfortunately, there are some cliques or groups groups of experts like you know the, the the judicial system the prosecution the prosecutors who are really intervened and who really are interrelated with each other so if they would appoint each other 
to some positions. And if they are totally independent from the people, and now I speak very idealistically, but in reality, if they have, there are no means of controlling them, or at least no means of, of, take, of making them accountable for the actions, that might lead to another problem. Because as said, it, it might be true that it's not only the prosecutor who has really much touch of reality. There might be other people who are within the cliques protecting each other, like the prosecutors, like the judges, like maybe some other spheres. So I think they, in Ukrainian situation, and under these circumstances, they have to be accountable and responsible to, to the people, basically. Yeah? Okay, nonetheless, uh, there are some other personal changes that took place in Ukraine for the current week. Members of National Agency for Prevention of Corruption have chosen their chief. The body's head is Natalia Korchak, lecturer of the National Academy of the Public Prosecutor's Office of Ukraine. Besides, once she had teached Arseny Yatsenyuk, Ukrainian Prime Minister. Launching the National Agency for Prevention of Corruption is the last requirement to be fulfilled in the first quarter within the framework of the visa free dialogue with the EU. An incumbent mayor, Yuri Vilkul, has won the municipal election in Krivoy Rih. It was reported by City Election Committee after the processing of all the results. Saman Samanchenko from Samopomich party is on the second place. Official results on elections will be announced in five days after the consideration of all complaint bills. But already now, observers and experts say that there will be no second tour of elections. There were no serious violations reported the observers of Opora Civil Network, but the part of minor violations increased by one quarter in comparison with previous elections. In particular, it is connected with mass and organized transportation of voters. Also, this time experts counted ballots with mistakes. There are near 10% of them. The major part of uh, violation was made not during the voting itself, but during the unfair election campaign. However, there is another important voting for Ukrainians which is going to take place in the Netherlands. As for the referendum on EU Ukraine Association Agreement left only five days, let me recall the latest results of opinion polling. For the moment, we can observe the relative balance between yes and no camps. So 35% of Dutch citizens will vote for ratification of agreement and 36% against. According to the results, the voters' turnout is expected to be 42%. And to recognize the result of referendum and to put it to consideration of parliament, the voters' turnout should be 30%. Meanwhile, the activities of Yes campaign participants became more and more diverse as well as split level, from street flash mobs to high official meetings and forums. And there is little time left before the voting. Ukrainians use a variety of creative forms to persuade Dutch citizens to favor the association agreement. On 6 of April, referendum will take place in Netherlands, on which Dutch citizens will decide whether to adopt the association agreement with Ukraine. In order to draw attention to Ukraine, civil activists have begun the information campaign, because the decision of Netherlands will influence the economic development of Ukraine. It's a highly developed country with a great potential, which provides you with all possible opportunities. And I think uh, the fact that the Netherlands are the first largest investor in the economy of Ukraine among uh, the Western countries is uh, speaking for itself. Holland, thank you for flowers. This is the name of flash mob which was organized in social networks. Ukrainian politicians and civil activists uploaded their photos with tulips. In this way, they expressed their gratitude to the Netherlands for spring flowers. Together, 5,000 of video messages to Dutch people will appeal to support Ukraine at the referendum. This is the goal of civil initiative Tak is Ya. This is the video message of famous Ukrainian public figures and simple citizens. Shakhtar Donetsk is the pride of the Donbass. And Droda is the massive passion of Limburg mining area. You and I have shared heart of coal. Netherlands are getting acquainted with Ukraine. Such information campaigns have been started by Ukrainians in Netherlands. In their videos, they tell about Ukraine and what does the referendum mean for them. Regarding the cultural dimension of our cooperation, I would like to note that in April this year, we will hold the uh, week of uh, Ukrainian cinema in Amsterdam. It will be extremely useful and very interesting project about new and classic Ukrainian movies, which have received really good international awards. The event took place from 31st of March to 1st of April. During the festival, Ukraine on film, Way to Freedom, viewers watched three documentaries about significant events for Ukraine.
Elevens by Ziga Vertov, Russian Woodpecker by Chada Gracia, and Winter on Fire by Yevhen Afinevsky. So as we could see, there are a lot of activities which are increasing by the time that the referendum will take place on 6th of um, April. And um, I would like to ask you, how do you estimate the effectiveness of such uh, campaigns? Well, um, because uh, do you think and do you think that uh, there will be, there is an opportunity, the possibility of a side effect when the Dutch citizens will be uh, over, well, uh, would, overwhelmed yeah. with that uh, emphasizing of Ukraine? Um, I think there are three, there are three aspects, of, aspects I would like to highlight. First, I, what I find particularly positive about what is going on, well, I do find negative the whole idea of the Netherlands voting on yes or no, and there, because this is really putting on question, it's not only about Ukraine, it's also, also about the European Union politics, its future and things like that, we all know that. But we have to admit that Ukraine, in Western media, it was always a passive position in terms that something happens in Ukraine, the, the worse the situation, the better for the news, like, you know, like the plane crash or again any type of revolution or revolt and then we're on the news like a not really developed country I once even took a picture from a Dutch book on languages so in the language they had an example of Ukrainian language and short description of it and the picture was of some um, really lower class workers who look really hungry and poor and who were eating some kind of bread. So there was an awful picture in a Dutch textbook on Ukraine as such. So this is like the image we're getting from Ukraine saying something happened, they are poor and let's like, let's not take care of them but let's at least uh, feel pity for them. So now if Ukrainians, uh, we, we using different campaigns and different types are really telling the Dutch audience what Ukraine is about so that we are not all poor and that we are not that underdeveloped and things like that. This is a very positive thing. Secondly, I, yes, I do see a point with overwhelming the, the, the audience with too much information about Ukraine. I can tell with, about one activity which I'm familiar with, with activity of the Ukrainian Academy of Leadership. I happen to have this pleasure of uh, teaching there. So they also went to the Netherlands to promote and campaign for Ukraine. So they had this idea of let's make 5,000 friends and meet people and hand out leaflets. And what, what they're telling and posting on, on uh, social networks is that not all the people were even especially the younger audience, so to speak. Not all of them were aware that such a referendum is taking place. So, and on the other hand, there is also a touch of a particular country putting forward the idea of voting no. And this is definitely the Russian position. Uh, I also read some leaflets and watched on online some discussions at the Dutch universities, like Maastricht and Groningen, that discussion about, the, and we can definitely see there are some people who put forward not the pro-Ukrainian position, but pro-Russian position, which is by definition, as they presented the anti-Ukrainian uh, as such. But I really hope for that the Dutch would vote yes, because as said, it's not about Ukraine as such, it's also about the European values. It's also about Ukrainian choice to be the part of the European family of countries. And I think what we can do is like stay and remain positive about that issue. Thank you so much for being here, our Thank guests, you for and uh, for your important comments. Um, and uh, it was um, Maxim Yakovlev, political expert and uh, associate professor at the political science department of Kiev Mahila Academy. <laughs>